shall we assess the claim that STR has eliminated absolute time and space? Well, the first thing that needs to be said is that the verificationism, which characterized Einstein's original formulation of STR, belongs essentially to the philosophical foundations of the theory. The whole theory rests upon Einstein's redefinition of simultaneity in terms of clock synchronization via light signals. But that redefinition assumes, necessarily, that the time which light takes to travel between two relatively stationary observers, A and B, is the same from A to B as from B to A in a round trip journey. That assumption presupposes that A and B are not both in absolute motion, though relatively stationary with respect to each other. Or in other words, that absolute space uh, nor privileged reference frame exists. The only justification for that assumption is that it is empirically impossible to distinguish uniform motion from rest relative to such a frame. And if absolute space and absolute motion or rest are undetectable empirically, therefore they do not exist and may even be said to be meaningless. But if verificationism belongs essentially to the foundations of STR, the next thing to be said is that verificationism has proved to be completely untenable and is now obsolete. The untenability of verificationism is so universally acknowledged that it will not be necessary to rehearse the objections against it here. Verificationism provides no justification for thinking that Newton erred, for example, in holding that God exists in a time which exists independently of our physical measures of it and which may or may not be accurately registered by them. It matters not a whit whether we finite creatures know what time it is in God's absolute time. God knows, and that is enough. Now, I am not here endorsing Newton's view on divine eternity, but I am saying that the natural theologian who, like Newton, believes God to be temporal need not be phased by STR, because STR's claim that absolute time does not exist is founded essentially upon a defunct and untenable epistemology. If we do suppose that God is in time, then how should we understand STR? Henri Poincaré, the great French mathematician and precursor of STR, helped to point the way. In a fascinating passage in his essay, The Measure of Time, Poincaré briefly entertains the hypothesis of an infinite intelligence, an intelligence infinie, and considers the implications of such a hypothesis. Poincaré is reflecting upon the problem of how we can apply one and the same measure of time to spatially distant events. What does it mean, for example, to say that two thoughts in two people's minds occur simultaneously? Or what does it mean to say that a supernova occurred before Columbus saw the new world? Like a good verificationist, Poincaré says, and I quote, all these affirmations have by themselves no meaning. Then he remarks, we should first ask ourselves how one could have had the idea of putting into the same frame so many worlds impenetrable to one another. We should like to represent to ourselves the external universe, and only by so doing could we feel that we understood it. We know that we can never attain this representation. Our weakness is too great. But at least we desire the ability to conceive an infinite intelligence for which this representation could be possible, a sort of great consciousness which should see all and which should classify all in its time as we classify in our time the little we see. This hypothesis is indeed crude and incomplete because this supreme intelligence would be only a demigod. Infinite in one sense, it would be limited in another. 
since it could have, uh, would have only an imperfect recollection of the past. It could have no other, since otherwise all recollections would be equally present to it, and for it there would be no time. And yet, when we speak of time, for all which happens outside of us, do we not unconsciously adopt this hypothesis? Do we not put ourselves in the place of this imperfect God, and do not even the atheists put themselves in the place where God would be if he existed? What I have just said shows us, perhaps, why we have tried to put all physical phenomena into the same frame. But that cannot pass for a definition of simultaneity, since this hypothetical intelligence, even if it existed, would be for us impenetrable. It is therefore necessary to see something else. Poincaré here suggests that in considering the notion of simultaneity, we instinctively put ourselves in the place of God and classify events as past, present, or future according to his time. Poincaré does not deny that from God's perspective, there would exist relations of absolute simultaneity. But he rejects the hypothesis as yielding a definition of simultaneity because we could not know such relations. Such knowledge would remain the exclusive possession of God himself. Clearly, Poincaré's misgivings are relevant to a definition of simultaneity only if one is presupposing some sort of verification of theory of meaning, as he undoubtedly was. The fact remains that God knows the absolute simultaneity of events, even if we grope in total darkness. Nor need we be concerned with Poincaré's worry that such an infinite intelligence would be a mere demigod, since there is no reason to think that a temporal being cannot have a perfect recollection of the past. There is no conceptual difficulty in the idea of a being which knows all past tense truths. His knowledge would be constantly changing as more and more events become past, but at each successive moment, he could know every past tense truth that there is at that moment. Hence, it does not follow that if God is temporal, he cannot have perfect recollection of the past. Poincaré's hypothesis suggests, therefore, that if God is temporal, his present is constitutive of relations of absolute simultaneity. Compare H. A. Lorenz's uh, illustration of a world spirit, or Weltgeist, in his letter to Einstein in January of 1915. In words redolent of the general scolium and optics of Newton, Lorentz broached considerations whereby, he said, I cross the borderland of physics. He wrote, a world spirit who, not being bound to a specific place, <coughs> permeated the entire system under consideration, or in whom this system existed, and who could feel immediately all events would naturally distinguish at once one of the systems, U, U prime, etc., above all the others. Such a being, says Lorentz, could directly verify simultaneity. On this view, the philosopher J. N. Findlay was wrong when he said, the influence which harmonizes and connects all the world lines is not God, not any featureless, inert medium, but that living, active interchange called light, offspring of heaven, firstborn. On the contrary, the use of light signals to establish clock synchrony would be a convention which finite and ignorant creatures have been obliged to adopt. But the living and active God, who knows all, would not be so dependent. In God's temporal experience, there would be a moment which would be present in absolute time, whether or not it were registered by any clock time. He would know without any dependence on clock synchronization procedures or any physical operations at all, which events were simultaneously present in absolute time. 
He would know this simply in virtue of his knowing at every such moment the unique class of present tense truths at that moment without any need of physical observation of the universe. 